Okay, this is another video on the meter, but I'm going to use it sort of as a heads up about how I do this in case I die or something. So every time I get into this, it's so obvious that the Bible is the Word of God, I feel like I shouldn't be allowed to live and know this. And maybe I will die. So here's this is just going to be like a little brief how-to. The first thing you do when the first hint that a passage is metered is first of all it's at the beginning of a letter, at the beginning of a Bible book. There should always be, I haven't tested them all yet, but there should always be something within the first five verses of a Bible book that is metered to tell you when that book is written. I found it at the beginning of Isaiah. Um, I didn't check the beginning of Daniel, but the, even the chapter 9 of Daniel is metered. The beginning of chapter 53 in Isaiah was metered. The beginning of Psalm 90 was metered. In fact, that's what Peter's playing on. So that's the first thing, is that the beginning of a letter or a Bible book, and sometimes even a chapter at least, should have a meter in it. The question in my mind is, is it strictly a seven meter like we see here, which the book of Revelation also uses. The book of Revelation uses the same meter in Revelation 1, 1 through 3. Is that always going to be the case? But Jude's meter was divisible by three for a date line. So I'm like, oh, okay. So there's, you know, because it's metered, there could be lots of variation. That's your first thing. The second thing which you look for, and it's really prominent in Peter, just like it was in Ephesians, the, the text in the translation, and I'll tell you why that matters, the text in the translation is very syrupy. If you look at Ephesians 1, 3-14, the text is extremely syrupy in translation. Okay? The, the syrupiness of the translation is a heads up that the text in the Greek is actually much more precise and metered. I found this every single time the same was true for the Hebrew. Because Psalm 90 is very syrupy in translation. So that was my second big hint. Now I, I put all what I'm telling you in my Bible Hebrew meter characteristics. And it's in the, the time section of my channel page. It's got a, a picture of a stick figure as the icon, a stick figure on a white background. So just download the Word doc that's in that video and you'll, you'll be able to know, you know how I do this in detail. Okay. But then some of the things I didn't say in that document I need to cover here. First of all, I'm you know just asserting to you, oh, well, this is Moses' meter in Psalm 90. Well, but how do I know it's Moses' meter in Psalm 90? Because I haven't examined all the metered passages in the Bible. This is where you get into a little bit of art science stuff. You look at the interplay between the meter and the keywords. Okay, that's what I did when I exit, you know, did the thing for Ephesians and for Mary. And I'm going to show you an exa a full-fledged example in a minute. But what are the key words in just these three verses that tip you off to Psalm 90? Well, first of all, I didn't even know to go look at Psalm 90 till I read 1 Peter 1. And he talks about Psalm 90 in several ways in both of his letters. He's doing that because they think the rapture is going to happen. I didn't need the meter to know that. I needed the text. Okay, the meter gives you much more information and precision about how to interpret the text. Again, this is not Bible codes. This is a rhetorical style to help you track, like a concordance, other Bible passages that the guy's got in mind when he's writing. And the first, divisible by seven, and possibly divisible by three section, is intended to be a dateline. It's intended to be a dateline that's very sophisticated. As in Moses, Peter is using 84 times 7 
and and that's supposed to date back to a significant event in Israel's history here it dates back to the restarting of the construction of second temple under Zerubbabel that depending on how you want to date that that's 522 521 BC and then they finished it in 516 BC given the, the, the fact that Peter's writing when the second temple is about to go down that's pretty significant given also that the second temple construction restarted on what was predicted to be Christ's birthday and Haggai too God coming twice on the same day to tell Zerubbabel start and he visits him on the anniversary of the laying of the foundation which is also what would become Hanukkah the 25th of Kislev all right and Christ was born that day well Christ is the foundation of our salvation Christ we are the temple of Christ right and that's Ephesians 2 two walls I mean it couldn't get cleverer than this this is how you know God wrote the Bible nobody is as smart okay all that is referenced in the 84 okay by using 84 rather than some other number the thing I don't know and I'm I have to I just don't know my history well enough is 84 then equates to 66 AD in the Bible's own Anno Domini accounting which because of they're using Roman AUC Aborbe Condita there were three different systems of Aborbe Urbe Condita available to them to use as a dating system in the time they were writing there was Vero and two others and Vero's system was the legal system that the Roman Empire adopted but there were two others okay I think one was Plutarch and somebody else who said that Vero's accounting was wrong by three years so that's why we got this variance all right so 84 minus what they called 66 using Paul's Anno Domini accounting in Ephesians would be equivalent to our 68 roughly I gotta hone that down better okay so 84 minus 66 using their accounting equates to 18 BC I have no idea what's important about 18 BC what was important about Jerusalem because they'd have to be talking about Israel because he's using the 84 of Moses which I have yet to show you why I know that so what's important about 18 BC I don't know I gotta find out okay so now how I know it's Moses first of all this it's dative case plural it means refugees it means aliens it's usually translated strangers in English okay that's real important because that ties directly to the fact that Israel you know was foreign they were aliens in the land of Egypt and they're supposed to have their exodus exodus is a kind of a parallel shorthand for rapture okay refugees strangers aliens okay that's a term that's used in Psalm 90 about taking refuge in God you are our refuge so he starts off right away reminding the reader of Psalm 90 okay and if that weren't enough he's now reminding them of Isaiah 53 10 diasporas see when you read this in English you don't think of the, the connections you have to see it in the Greek what's a diaspora it's a scattering of seed when you're a farmer and you're getting ready to plant you make your furrows and then you walk the rows and you throw the seed into the rows okay so it's getting it's planting a crop they're in diaspora because God is planting a crop of believers so that the people who are not believers can get the word and get saved okay so that's what diaspora really means we get spore in English from this okay that's a big prominent term in Psalm 90 also it's also a big prominent term in Isaiah 53 10 in particular because it's that's the contract 
if you will give your soul as a substitute for sin, you will see long-lived seed. Okay, and I'm quoting it directly from the Hebrew, freely translating it. Not really all that freeing, it's almost a literal translation. So now he's tying Isaiah to Psalm 90 when he uses just that word. So you can't just read the Bible like a novel. You gotta go slow. Okay, because the text is syrupy in translation. So you miss all this. You miss the cleverness of it. Okay, and now he's listing, this is all Paul's own stomping ground, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, province of Asia, which we call Turkey today, and Bithynia, and I think Bithynia is on the coast, uh, left-hand side of Turkey. I forget where Bithynia really is, okay. All right, so he's already tied in Moses and Moses and Isaiah here, okay. And now he's giving a location. This is the prophecy of the light to the Gentiles. Okay? And of course, that's a prominent theme in Isaiah. So see, we're still tracking to both of them. Because Isaiah deliberately patterned his meter. I showed it in the Isaiah meter hypothesis videos. He's deliberately tracking to Psalm 90. He even breaks up the beginning and ending of Isaiah 53 divides the 84 into two 42s, which is what Matthew uses to play his, you know, honor roster of the genealogy in Matthew 1. Okay, so they all knew this meter thing, because they're all playing to him. All right, so so is Peter. So Peter was no slouch about Greek, that he can do this. Now here's my problem. This at this point... See, I, I tried to divide it this time syntactically into clauses. This is a clause. This is a clause. This is obviously a clause. And each clause has doctrinal significance. That's one of the rules you have to follow in parsing, is make sure you're doing it syntactically. My first video on this, I was just doing the raw meter count. So how come I don't have anything divisible by 7 by this point? Because that's the end of the subunit, okay? I should have something. Moses divided his meter like this. This was he he. Of course, he did. He had his meter divided by three at this point. When he came to his section, that's roughly analogous to this in Psalm 90. It was 24 syllables and then 48. Okay, Peter's using 41. Is he using 41 and he means 48? The play on Moses. Because, you know, it's minus seven years for the tribulation church isn't going to be in it. Is that some kind of a joke? It could be. But the point is, is 41 doesn't divide. You know, 10, 12, and 19 is 41. And it doesn't divide by 3 or by 7. And I can't figure out what would be 41 would be significant either. <coughs> but that's not true of the next clause. Kata prognosin teu patros and hagiosin numatas. Okay, in my American accent in Greek. Okay, this adds up to 58. That's important because that was a keystone in Daniel 9. So now he's wrapping in Daniel 9, which wrapped to Isaiah 53 and wrapped to Psalm 90 in, in the most sophisticated meter that I've ever found in the Bible to date, except maybe Mary's. Okay. So now he's wrapping to Daniel because this total is 58. And Daniel used 58 to stress how Manasseh was the cause of the downfall of the temple. Okay? Daniel's chronology is a chronology of Israel's kings to show how Isaiah's prophetic recounting of the kings in Isaiah 53 in his meter, which is running below the text of Isaiah 53. Daniel used this 58 as a centerpiece because Manasseh was explicitly said in scripture and I gave you the, the verses uh, in the Daniel 9 word doc that Manasseh was the cause of the downfall of the temple. There are verses in Kings about it. Okay, that it was due to Manasseh that the temple went down. Okay. 
So 58 is one day after 57. 57 is the number of days between the beginning of Passover and Pentecost. 57 days from Pentecost, counting Pentecost, to 9th Ave when the temple went down the first time is also 57. And, and so basically 58 means high, you're a day late, a dollar short. That was also Manasseh's age when he died. I think I think it was his age when he died. It was something significant to his age, either when he died or when he became uh, free of Assyria, something like that, or his ruling time, something about that. Daniel was playing on all three things. All right. Well, then Peter is too, because this is 58. That's not by mistake. And notice how it's all tied to the temple. Okay, so that's doctrinally significant meter. So he's telling you, even though the words, okay, if you just read them in translation, you wouldn't know any of this. You'd have to read it in Greek. You'd have to know your other Greek passages. You'd have to know the meter before it would clue into you how to read these verses. See, he's telling you another story, sotto voce, in the time-honored tradition since Moses. Because Moses used the same style, only with Hebrew, okay? So 58, that's significant. Okay, John also uses 58 in uh, Revelation 1, 1 and 2. And I'm like, okay, so this is where John is getting it for his own meter, all right, which he uses as a dateline. And that was really weird to me because 58 isn't divisible by 3 or by 7. But when by the time he gets to his 7, he's also using 84 telling you that he's writing 84 years after Judea became a province, okay, which means 91 A.D. in their Anno Domini, about 94 A.D. in ours. And I'm like, what? So immediately I'm faced with the question, well, wait a minute, 84, is this really late and Peter dies like in 90? Well, that doesn't agree with any of the scholarship we've got. And so far, every time I've done a metered passage, it's agreed with the scholarship we've got. And they don't know anything about the meter. They're coming up with their dates for other reasons. So it, I, I'm assuming okay, that this 84 does not mean the way you know John used it, 84 years after Judea became a province. All right, because that would be a very late letter for Peter. And then all the rest of what we think we know about this timeline doesn't fit. And it also doesn't fit what he's writing either. Okay, because he's writing about the temple about to go down. Well, we know it went down in 70 AD. So this 84 has to be referencing an earlier important historical date that he's benchmarking. 84 sevens is, is 588 years. 588 years before Peter wrote the temple construction was recommencing. Well, that makes sense, okay? The temple's going down, so the temple's gotta be rebuilt where? In the people, in the seed, in the diaspora, playing on what Paul wrote, because that's what Paul's writing about in Ephesians 1 and 2. Because Paul's already forecasted in his own meter a sort of you know history of the Roman Empire all the way to the end of Odovacher and how the seed are going to get spread and grow. That's the whole theme of Paul's meter. Okay, well then Peter's got to be addressing that because he's quoting Paul here. All right, that's an exact quote of Paul. And he's even using the same meter Paul used. In Ephesians 1, 3 through 4, that's the first time we get the dateline meter in Paul. You have to skip the first two verses in Paul. He doesn't begin his, his, his metering until verse 3 in Ephesians 1. And so Peter sort of play into that. Because he's quoting Paul and he's using the same meter. Okay, and see this red? That's elision. Okay. Not ellipsis. I called it ellipsis in the last video because I was just too excited. It's elision. It's natural elision. And there isn't going to be much of it. And you assume that there's no elision until after you first parse the verse and then evaluate the doctrinal significance of the words 
to see what kind of meter is intended. And you usually won't have too much elision. Okay? Now, so here we got the play on Daniel 9. Okay, now look. Now he goes to Paul. Prognosing. The foreknowledge of God. That's exactly what Paul was writing about in Ephesians 1. Okay? Okay, and he's, he's sort of playing. He's, he's talking about fathering because this is seed. Okay? God the Father. Okay? And then by the sanctifying work of the Spirit. See, he's adding, he's, he's deliberately putting in words so he can get to this meter. Okay? He, he doesn't have to word it this way. He could have used he could have made this into he could made this into a noun. Okay? Like Paul did. He could have he could have changed this into in other words. Okay? He just could he could have even left this word out. He could have just said en numatas and the meaning would be the same. He doesn't have to put this word in there. Hagiasmo. He doesn't have to put that in there. If he just said endumatas because it's an arthritis, we all know it's the Holy Spirit. He doesn't have to add this. He doesn't have to say it by the sanctifying work. But he's padding the meter. He's padding it to get to 58. He wouldn't get to 58 if he didn't stick this in there. That's three extra syllables. Hagiasmoi, four extra syllables. If he'd have left it out, it would have been 54. It still would have been pregnant because God ends Daniel 9.27 with 54 syllables in Hebrew. Because God did a metered reply in Daniel 9.25 through 27, which I already put in my Psalm 90 playlist. Okay? So this is deliberate. Absolutely deliberate. Okay? And I'm going to post another video on this that's simpler. But resulting from is how this should be translated. All the Bibles translate it wrong. Resulting from the obedience and atoning blood of Jesus Christ. All the translations get that phrase wrong. Okay? They get it wrong. Alright, well he didn't have to word this this way. He could have left this out and we'd have still known a man atoning blood. He didn't have to stick the word atoning in there. Okay? He didn't have, in fact, this whole clause. He could have just left this out and just said, I is Jesu Christu. Obviously, he's padding it for a reason. Okay? The doctrinal meaning would not change if these words were left out. So he's being real deliberate about it. See, you can't tell any of this from the translation. You get so much more out of the Greek. That's why all those King James only people are going to be at the bottom of heaven. Saved, but boy, oh boy, at the bottom because they trashed learning the original. Okay? And we got the original, and the meter helps you know we got the original because, hello, this is too perfect and too genius. And that's also kudos to all those hard scholars, the scholars who work so hard to make sure we got good text. Congratulations to them, baby. Look at the good work that they did. Because they don't know the meter. I'm the only one on this planet right now who knows the meter. Okay, so they didn't know. God enabled them to get it right. Look at this. Look at what God did for the scholars. Look at how hard their work was in the 1800s when they found all these manuscripts. Okay, we got 58 here. Sorry if I rant. 58 here. Okay, so what's this? This ends up adding to 74. 74 is not divisible by 3 or by 7. He's doing it on purpose. If he wanted it to be divisible by 3 or 7, he could have taken out this. Pantismon, that's three syllables. Okay, that would have been 71. That would have been evocative of the Sanhedrin. He could have taken out Hymatos. We wouldn't take out Hymatos. He could have taken out Kai and changed the cases here. All right? And then it would have been 73. That would have been evocative. Okay? He could have just said Christu. 
using his title instead of Yesu Christo. So they could have taken out two syllables, then it would have equaled 72. And then it would have been divisible by 12. You see the point? <coughs> he deliberately <coughs> put these words in <coughs> so that it will not equal 7. It will not be divisible by 7 or 3. See, this I'm, I'm trying to explain to you that one of the tests that I use of the meter, am I, am I getting his syllable count right? Well, what if he did it differently? Okay, he's obviously padding the text. Okay, then you got Hades, Humin, Kairene. See, because that's got to be a crassus. Okay, play through thing. And here's another keyword. It tells you now that he's talking not only to Psalm 90, because this means multiply. Actually, it means multiply so that you have this overabundant crop, way more than you expected. Okay, well, that's time back to seed here. Okay, that's time back, therefore, to Isaiah and Psalm 90, but he's also tying to Paul and Philippians, because that's the whole theme of Philippians. He's also tying to the Magnificat. Here's the Magnificat. When Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord, it's magnified by multiplying. Greek verb there is metaluno, megaluno. This is in my Mary Magnificat playlist. You can download this document. Paul uses the same term in Philippians. When it says you magnify the Lord, it really means multiply. In other words, the praise that's in your head, the Bible that's in your head, is going to multiply to the glory of God. And he's using a synonym for that right here. The Greek verb there is plethuno. Okay? It's a stronger word than plero. The thuno ending, the uno ending, makes it stronger. So he's em emphasizing the multiplication of the seed that's being sown all over the world, specifically with reference to the Gentiles, fulfilling the prophecy to the Gentiles, because the temple's gonna go down and this is now extremely relevant. You see how gorgeous this is? Could you get that from a translation? Answer is no. Now I'm gonna stop here because I'm afraid my recorder's gonna die, and then I'll pick up at verse three.